contrary to popular wishes, we haven't all been condemned to spend the rest of our lives coding in Python. This is episode 14 of the Tux Radar podcast. I'm Paul Hudson. I'm Mike Saunders. I'm Andrew Gregory. And I'm Graham Morrison. And of course, we'll have publishing news, features and more on TuxRadar.com. Whenever we feel like it's a book market today. And if you fancy subscribing to the magazine, you can go to tinyurl.com slash podcast LXF. In this episode, top news, SUSE Studio is out. Uh, while Debian adopts time-based releases, a hot topic should we give coverage to companies who don't support Linux actively and our open ballot should we use free software services. Okay, this is the news. Um, our top story for this episode is uh, the release of SUSE Studio. Dong! Stoot, stoot, studio! <laughs> um, this is an online distribution builder, effectively, although... Uh, Novell like to push it as an appliance builder that creates your own customized version of Linux that you can then give to your friends or give to your colleagues or actually put in some operating environment. As, as if there weren't enough Linux distributions already. I know, I know. Or it's, actually put in an operating environment, damn. Yeah, it's I an know. Operating system. I know, I've been there. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, do things like create a live CD, a USB install, and according to Nat Friedman, it's been an unprecedented success. Um, I checked this he's morning. He's boss for it, isn't he? Yes. So, yeah. so according Nat, to Sousa's Pravda arm. Well, <laughs> I mean, when it was uh, it was released sometime last week, and I checked this morning, according to their site, there's 6,419 appliances have been built. So that's, that uh, sounds like a lot. Five and a half thousand variants of Sousa with ISWM as the window <laughs> manager. <laughs> <laughs> Distro watch the list has suddenly got a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Sousa. <laughs> but I, I'm really surprised at how uh, popular it seemed to have been. I mean, just another distro builder. It's yeah, something. but it, it's done really, really well, isn't it? it you know, there's, there's, um, there's been lots of ways to make distros, remaster distros in the past. Um, but this, the way it lets you just click an icon to set your theming. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's really easy. It's, it looks great. You know, you could make a distro for your lug or for your family or for anybody with, you know, and, minimal number of clicks. And the test drive, did you see that as well? You can test drive your distribution before you using, download Using it. Flash. Using Flash, yes. Yeah. Not, really? not Silverlight, which is what I would have thought. But yeah. <laughs> or Moonlight. But, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it uses Flash, but actually it's very cool because you get a full hour with your distro to fiddle around with it. And what's very, very clever, uh, the host system, not the guest that's running, the host system monitors all the changes taking place inside the distro. So you can actually see, show me all the files that have changed and the files you don't want to change, like, you know, if it ah. generates SSH keys or whatever, you don't, want, you don't want that to be saved. So you can ignore them and say, actually, you know, I've changed this on purpose. Save those changes to my image, please, and modify it on the fly, basically. That's very cool. It's very cool, yeah. But oh. closed source. Yes, which is difficult, isn't it, really, for such an innovative product? It would be nice if we could, we could create our own distribution creating software using that as a framework. Well, a, a piece of software to create distribution creating yeah, software. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm getting an infinite loop, <laughs> in, my, infinite loop in my head. Meta here now. distro stuff. That's yeah. really clever. I wonder what their motivation is for keeping it closed source, I suppose. Well, I asked, I asked uh, Nat Friedman, and he said, uh, We actually do plan to open source a few components of Studio that are not yet open over time. But right now, we just had to launch. Right. That's what he said. And I, I said Launchpad was very similar, because it was. And he said, yes, they did indeed open it. Five or six years later, he yeah, said. Yeah. Uh, so I guess they're in no massive rush, but they do plan to open it. Well, that's cool. I mean, the thing with Launchpad was that I think I remember Mark Shuttleworth at the time saying there was no reason to open it. They didn't see a purpose behind it, so they weren't going to put any effort behind it. But uh, I like the idea that you can create Zen and VMware images with it. Mm. That sounds very neat, because mm. that fits into the whole cloud thing, where you could presumably create a Zen image and then upload it to EC2 or whatever it is you want to do. Or just, just push it. Don't download and upload. Just yeah, just yeah. Automatically. Push it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Or blow it. Blow, blow the cloud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, actually, I'm curious because this is something that VMware have been doing very well themselves recently. They've been doing this virtual appliance thing. And this is very, very similar. They want to, to push out a finished distro straight as an appliance. Yeah, this yeah. is exactly one thing. And you know, the main reason for it, according to Nat, is simply that... Um, a lot of people spend time wasting uh, reading manuals, trying to get software A working with distro B, when realistically software A should be installed on distro B out of the box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this way, you've, you've got one test base to work with. We certify our software for this exact platform. Uh, and that it's good. It seems like a good way to save time. But I am a bit worried that it may end up um, taking away the whole uh, vendor independence we've had for quite a while. Like, you know, if Red Hat annoys you, hey, just switch to Novell. Or if Novell annoys you, hey, switch to Ubuntu. Um, you can do that right now. But whereas if they're saying, "Listen, here's our software. 
uh, you know, wonder foo, the OS, you, you have no choice. It has to be SUSE. It has to be this thing here. They kind of lock you in in a way, which is a, a strange choice. Or even more worryingly, you have to use that specific version of, of SUSE. And if you want to use a different piece of software, True, you've got yeah. to use yet another. You do, yeah. But you do get five or seven years support, don't you? Which is quite nice. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good move. It's a good move for them. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. Well, hopefully it'll help them catch up with Ubuntu a little bit because there are so many Ubuntu respins now. Yeah. It's so easy to do. Yeah, yeah. Despite not having a wonderful Flash interface. <coughs> okay, in uh, other news, Alan Cox, the uh, famed kernel hacker. The Alan Cox. The Alan Cox uh, has quit as the TTY uh, maintainer in the <gasps> kernel. Uh, this follows a bit of uh, tit for tat over um, a p- on the kernel mailing list. Well, Flame with, Wars <laughs> with uh, drama. Linus Torvalds himself over uh, who caused the problem and who should fix it. Linus, in uh, his very nice and friendly way, says, um, "Quite frankly, I don't understand why I should even have to bring these issues up to Alan. Um, you should have tried to fix this problem immediately, without arguing against fixing the kernel, without blaming user space, without making idiotic excuses for bad kernel behaviour." This prompted Alan to reply with, uh, I've had enough. If you think that problem is easy to fix, you fix it. Have fun. (laughs) (laughs) And and that was the end of that. I mean, both of them have worked together for an awfully long time. I mean, almost since the very beginning of the Linux kernel. Yeah, I mean, Alan Cox has has historically been the kernel number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this TTY thing is quite a big deal. It's it's what well, uh, it's the terminals, it's the um, the text terminals, the consoles, the way those are handled. Um, Amazingly, quite, people quite are still writing. Still, people are still writing code to do this stuff, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> and creating books as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But perhaps that's why they've resolved it so quickly. Torvalds was very blunt and frank, and Alan Cox just said, "Well, that's it. I've had enough." Perhaps you know it is all a bit. Uh, it looks a bit babyish, but. If that's the end of that, you know, we, we've seen some flame wars go on for months. People yeah. shouting back and forth and throwing toys out of the pram. The Linus Andrew Trigel bitkeeper thing. Was, yeah, and it's quite silly. <laughs> it looks to me like Alan was a, a reluctant maintainer of TTY. He doesn't seem to have given uh, much of a fight in there. Uh, Keeping but it up. It's, it's, it must be pretty tedious. It's not really sexy, kind of, <laughs> kind of isn't it? You can, you know, hey, ladies, I work on the TTY layer. I just love the string of questions that uh, Tulvar's put in his email. Why? Why <laughs> blame Ewax? Why call Userland buggy when the bug was introduced by you and was in the kernel? Why are you fighting it? He just, just ranted on and on and on about some terminal bug, and I'm sure it's a lovely, important, wonderful bug, but it's still really small stuff, Linus. So, yeah. so didn't somebody else ask uh, Alan for some information later well, on? Well, yeah, yeah, later on. I think somebody blundered into the, uh, blundered into the subject. Um, Sergei Senojatsky. Senojatsky. Anyway, he he um he wanted to ask a question about uh, TTY, and uh, Alan replied with, "Please talk to the new TTY maintainer, whoever that ends up. I no longer care." Oh, they all need to kiss and make up, but uh, not literally. Well, no. To be fair, Alan has done nothing wrong with this, apart from you know had a bit of technical coding issues going on there. Fair enough. But he was really nice. He was really polite during the entire thing. He was trying to defend his side in a in a simple, pleasant mm-hmm. way. Because, you know, as you know, emails always get out of hand if you're not careful. Because yeah. you're taken in so many different ways. Uh, and I, I think the problem here is that some developers think they can be uh, very rude on mailing lists and get away with it. Well, yeah, geeks in general can be pretty rude. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I mean, that's the way that they are. They? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm on the other side of the fence. <laughs> Um, um, well, yeah, I mean, there's always been the antics of Theo de Rat of OpenBSD. He's Ooh, always had really, yeah, acerbic attitudes on mailing lists. But, you know, some people would argue that gets stuff done instead of all these platitudes and babying around and trying to tell everybody, well, you know, you've got the opportunity to do it right. Then, you know, just be frank. Maybe, maybe Alan Cox's code was not good. I don't know. It would help to be polite. I find it, find it awkward reading these kind of exchanges with Linus. It makes me feel a little bit embarrassed. Do you always put little emote icons then in all your emails to make sure they're not taken the wrong way? I'm, I'm overly polite, I think. Didn't, yeah, didn't he call was it the OpenBSD developers a bunch of masturbating monkeys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said something about the KDE guys as well, didn't he, recently? And, and before that, the GNOME guys. About everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Nazis or yeah. and, and, and then they came for me and I was all by myself. <laughs> and no, no one liked me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Another major news story is Debian. Debian. That's a news story? Yes, it is. <laughs> Debian. Debian. 
It's Debian good. adopts a time-based release cycle. Well, uh, it's, it's a time-based freeze cycle, yeah. uh, we should clarify it with. It, they're not going totally like Ubuntu in saying, we will release on this date regardless of what happens. But what they're going to do is they're going to freeze development at a certain point. They're going to say, that is enough. We're not going to keep rolling in new features and letting development creep on for months and months and months. And say this is the cutoff point for new features. That you know, there could still be three months, four months, six months, two years, one day. No, no they, they, did, they, that. they did say they'd release it next spring. Yeah, but they're they're not setting release dates. This, this is very, they're going to set well, a freeze date. Setting, setting release date of spring next year. Yeah, but it's I did, but they're not going to necessarily stick to that. They're not going to set any date. That's their goal. Just like they've always yeah, had is, goals. It's, it's, I'm sure it is. They said we'll release in December, uh, freeze in December, and next spring we'll definitely release it. So spring being... But I, I know, but they can't wait two years is what I'm saying. Two years isn't an option anymore. They've got maximum, what, four months to fiddle around? End, end of winter and then, what, start of, start of spring. So they've got maybe five months to hang around. But yeah, they are going to release in spring. Guaranteed. Well, With squeeze being I, the exception, apparently. I read that they said we're not going to actually make say anything about releases. So we've obviously read different stuff here. Well, what, what do they benefit from? What do they gain from doing that? I mean, I, I see the, the logic of Ubuntu where you have very safe, very predictable release dates. Mm-hmm. And I also see the, the benefit of how Debian used to do it, of, you know, we'll release it when it's ready. But this just seems like a, a fairly lame halfway house. That- well, it's a compromise, I guess, because it's never going to be ready. There's never going to be a good point to stop and say this is a release. So I guess it's, it's, a, it's a jump-off point where you well, say... I think like- this is why they've, they've got release in spring... So they've got like four months. Which to hemisphere? Fiddle around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you know, late spring, early spring, it's still three or four months to fiddle around with. So it's, it's not fixed. Yeah. But in that period, I think it's a great idea. I think you know, we we all have to work to some kind of schedule. Even Debian, <laughs> even my own. <laughs> well, my own personal little time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I think also they've said they they believed the previous two releases, both released in spring, were very very good. They had a lot of positive feedback from releasing in spring, apparently. <laughs> it is a logical time to release new things. Clearly, yeah. Um, so they want to repeat that in the future. The spring's a good time. I, 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 yeah, and I think if it if it makes major projects kind of force themselves to get into that release, I think that's a good thing as well. It's it's kind of Mark Shuttleworth's grand vision for everything kind of being synchronised. And so you're hoping that the KD guys will say. Hurry up, guys! We've got to finish KD three point five to get into, <laughs> to get into Debian. KD four point five. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's never going to happen, no, is it? KD, KD three point five. This is, <laughs> this is Debian we're talking about here. Um, and that leads us on to the final uh, news story, which is uh, late last night, British crap summertime. KD four point three was released. KD four point three. Um, Sixty three thousand changes, apparently. I don't think I haven't tried it. I don't think any of us have tried but it. Presumably, if you, if you insert a, a new line on the very first line of a sixty three thousand line file, I did like uh, on their press release. It said this one had focused on refining the unique features of KD four point two. Well, we're on to refining now. So, aren't we? yeah, that sounds like what? massaging the figures. And we're, we're on to calling them unique features now. Aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Books have always been unique features. Um, so what have we got? We got uh, actually the screenshots of Kwin and the uh, the compositing effects look very nice. There's a new theme, isn't there? It's, yeah, there's a new air. theme called air. air. I wonder who they're trying to sound like. I don't know. That? The KDE Air. It's, it's a lighter theme as well. <laughs> <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> Light and crisp. Lots of desktop cubes and shiny reflections and replacing stuff that's already been developed by other people. <laughs> Um, plasma, plasma has uh, had a few more plasmoids, and I think it was plasma that made it delayed for a week because there was a bit of a killer bug, big big memory leak. So it still sounds to me like plasma and plasmoids are too cutting edge for uh, everyday use. Uh, Dolphin gets little thumbnail previews of things. It's content aware, which it did have before. Yeah, it's content aware. Um, K Runner, a search and launch system. Now K Runner could really do with an overhaul because it needs to be like GNOME do. Um, since using GNOME 2. What's KRunner, Graham? KRunner is the, um, if you press Alt and F2, All right. you can the, type The in, run command. Yeah, the run command. But it, when you type in a command these days, you get a preview of the application that's going to run. You get a few options sometimes. It's halfway to being GNOME 2 oh. um, or Quicksilver. Can it do maths as well? Uh, <laughs> I think it might do. It, yes, it does. It does. I think you can do small sums in there. <laughs> but uh, anyway... Um, that's it, anyway, on the on the hit list of new features that I've got written in front of me. Didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't the incremental improvement thing cause big problems in the 3.x releases? Because by the end of it, 
3.5 was really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone liked it. <laughs> and then they dumped it all and went to 4.0. Everyone was like, no, stick to 3.5. It was really good. They obviously get bored with it. They, it's too comfortable when things are running well. And it's the same with KDevelop, <laughs> which I think has just had its second well, or third beta release. Well, presumably, if people are now using 4.x and liking it, then 4.3 is a great release for them. They're going, oh, this is just more refined, more features, enhancements. Not, not big changes. You know, if they like what they've got, yeah. they just want fixes faster. Features. I think those of us who are committed to using KDE, and I include myself in that, are, are always looking forward to the next release because it, it always adds stability and it always adds improvements that are going to make our lives easier. Um, you know, some of us just can't use other desktops. So Why not? Um, I don't know. I have genuinely just got used to the way KDE works. I, I, I like Conqueror and I, um, I like its file management and I, I'm not too keen on Dolphin, but, you know, I things like... The terminal. I like what, what you want there is like some sort of KDE fast forward button that'll get you KDE six point four. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. It's KDE five started planning yet. <laughs> so, so, Mike, you've got an interesting things to discuss about KDE, haven't you? Um, yeah, I think because I haven't used KDE properly fully in a long, on a long term basis since KDE one back in the late nineties, that I th- I'm going to spend the next two weeks using KDE four to find out to see. Oh, really? Yeah, really, genuinely. I think Completely. I will too. Really? Well, they run on your Macs. Oh, wait. <laughs> what day is it today? <laughs> April the 1st, no? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this will be like Graham's 30 days with GNOME. Yeah, does that mean I've got to switch back to GNOME? No, you're, XFCE. You're, you're, XFCE. You're, you're, you're switching to Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. I, I reckon you should try XFCE as well, because I don't think you've ever really used it to any great extent, have you? No. Or no, Tech I WN. On my PS3, on a Yellow Dog. I oh, really? Yeah. And will like? you switch to KDE? Yes, I will switch to KDE. For the next two weeks. So Just that's that's Andrew. <laughs> Mike, Andrew and me uh, all switch to KDE four point X. I'll be Kytel in Reservoir Dogs. I'm just gonna have to kill you now. We're all gonna use KDE four point X for the next two weeks and we'll report back on our endeavours uh, in two weeks' time. If if we can, if we're not completely broken by the experience. No, I'm sure it'll be positive. I, I haven't used KDE for fully for like KDE three point three or so. so. Right. Whenever plastic came out, I, I stopped using it. Used that briefly and ditched it. Um, so I'm going to go back to it and try it. So, the hot topic this month. Should we be giving coverage to manufacturers who don't support Linux? Now, this really applies to hardware, and we all know as Linux users that the majority of mainstream PC hardware out there does not explicitly support Linux. You don't see on the box a big penguin or, you know, works with Ubuntu, whatever. But we also know that a lot of companies do, you know, develop kernel drivers on the side or they get involved with projects, um, just not as actively as we'd like. So should we, as a magazine, as a Linux font magazine, and as a wider community, um, actually, should we ignore these companies that don't do anything with Linux? What do you reckon, Graham? Um, I don't think we should ignore them. I think the bottom line is that we all have to use their hardware, mm-hmm. um, whether it's whether it's the motherboard or network card or RAID card or whatever it is. We all use them. Um, we all end up groping in the dark for uh, through forums to find which which works best with the the setup that we're running. And and I think it it, it is valuable to get feedback and and give coverage to, to devices we know well, despite the manufacturer not perhaps officially supporting Linux but I think that should be done in the context of there is no official support from the manufacturer and that is bad you know I think if ever there's a a rival device that has official support then that should get our support in preference even if it's a a much worse device that's part of the problem isn't it you you may Mm, find something mm. you may find a music player that you know works well with Linux and has official bits and bobs, but if it's really rubbish and you'd rather have an iPod, then it's yeah. kind of difficult. Isn't I mean, it? it is the it is the age old question, but yeah, I think I think in certain circumstances, yeah, I would be inclined to. I think in the past in the magazine we've uh, we've you we've reviewed devices where the, the manufacturer has shown willing has sent mm. like uh, the hardware to to developers and and given them a chance to write drivers for it and. And I think that's good. I mean, that's a step in the right way. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of a company called Focusrite. And at the time, um, their marketing guy told me that they'd sent a survey out with all, with all of their audio devices to ask what operating systems they used. And he said less than 3% had ticked the Linux box. Right. So from a manufacturer's point of view, there was really no point in them investing in Linux support. No, but they don't always have to 
you know, put developers onto a project to provide Linux support, what they can do, as you mentioned before, is they can release the specs to the community or some specs, send some hardware to a geek, you know, just a few hundred quid, send the hardware, send the specs, and then the community will make the drivers. So I think some companies are reluctant thinking, you know, supporting a whole other operating system is going to cost us £100,000 in developer time and stuff, but it could actually be a lot easier than that. But they're even more worried about IP, aren't they? They're even more worried about, in their world, their competitors getting hold of their intellectual property and using it against them. That's true. Yeah, that often makes them in very the case reticent. Of, to... of AMD, ATI, and NVIDIA. Well, that's the only case, really, isn't it? I mean, not, not only webcam people out there going, oh, we've got more <laughs> megapixels. Well, How are the people? I don't know. find out. It could be, I think it must be the same with sound cards. I mean, I don't know with sound devices. Well, creative are open source now, aren't they? Creative have open source all the stuff now. Oh, have they? Yeah, they have. Get with the agenda. Yeah, there, there, there was a big hoo-ha about them. Creative's still going. Well, either way, I think we have moved on a long way in hardware in the last few years. I mean, I remember the absolute hell of Debian 2.2, where we'd be like, okay, now let's choose your Ethernet driver. It, and it gives you a huge list. Oh, I remember go, that. Is it this one? No. This one? You should go through the list until you find the right one. It goes, oh, it is that one. Well done, you got it right. And they could have scanned that for you, but it just chose not to. And of course, most geeks, and I should have known the brand of my, my network card, but I didn't. I just went through a whole lot, so I found them all. And of course, there were some that worked anyway, despite not being the right brand. Um, so we have moved on in hardware support a long way, but there are some companies steadfastly refusing to be interested. And uh, you know, NVIDIA seems very, very happy with its binary blob system, whereas ATI slash AMD are moving forward. They are being more open. And I think we should encourage that. Yeah, and I think that's probably due to competition. You know, that there's a niche to fill there with NVIDIA fitting fitting into the binary blob space. Yeah. You know, there's a space for Intel and for AMD ATI to, to look at being more open. Intel is now properly kick-ass. Yeah, I think yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, they, they are, in terms of absolute raw performance, you know, the latest games, whatever, you won't get it from Intel, I'm aware. But... But everything else, it's really cool yeah. because it now works out of the box. Tunnel mode setting, all this kind of thing just works, and that's incredible. I mean, clutter running on a, on a rubbishy netbook, I mean, it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, it shows what could be done if we had flawless hardware support in there. And uh, that'll only happen if manufacturers realise it's in the best interest of the customers for a change. And will that only happen if we only support manufacturers who support Linux? I think so, yeah. You know, I, I was for a while looking at buying a new, nice new Dell uh, laptop and um, I was insisting on getting an Intel card because I wanted the features until I found out they wanted 50 quid more for the Intel card than for the NVIDIA card because the NVIDIA one came in a package which was, you know, ended up being cheaper. Yeah. Once I'd made the same thing with Intel, uh, it would cost more, which is awful. So I <laughs> ended up not getting it. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I do want to support Intel and what they're doing, but I'm, I'm not necessarily willing to pay more for less. Yeah, yeah. Have, have you bought any hardware recently, Andrew, that uh, has been a disaster to get working with Linux? Yes, but we'll come to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll come to that in the Discover of the Week section. Ah, right. I was just thinking that every manufacturer that doesn't support Linux today is potentially a manufacturer that supports Linux tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So we should give everyone as much love as possible. Give everyone the opportunity. It's, it's not like really that easy. I mean, there are some um, manufacturers of printers, and I'm not going to name brands, but they're not very friendly to us because they don't support Linux. They're aware they don't support Linux. They don't want us to get their product and say, hey, this does not work, because that stops them getting sales. When there's some uncertainty, it might work, might not work, then they make some sales. People buy them and try them out and say, oh, we you know, it's my own fault, we're buying the wrong one, whatever. They blame themselves. Whereas if, if they give it to us and we say definitively, no, this does not work with Linux, they lose out. So these manufacturers do not want to provide us with hardware. Some people say, hey, we should review all the hardware that comes out. That's a great idea. Of course we should, we should, we should review the hardware that comes out. We often cannot get the hardware from the manufacturers. They don't want to talk to us. Even, even big companies like Dell, even big companies yeah. like yes, Dell. Yes, yeah, I had trouble getting Dell. a netbook from Dell. And they, yeah. they support Linux. And then they sell their stuff and, with Ubuntu. And, 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 and it's bit. very, very hard to get hardware from them. Um, so just so you know, listeners are aware, we are trying. They're just, just not interested. And it can also... It could it could be damaging for a company to not support Linux. Even you know, say we've got three percent market share, something really small like that on the desktop. People go to geeks to ask for hardware advice. People go if you know if, if somebody doesn't know much about computers, they're going to go to the nearest geek, and and there's a bigger chance that that geek will be a Linux geek as well. Yeah. And then say, right, I want to get a new graphics card. I want to get this, that, and the other. And you know, the the person asking the questions will probably be running Windows, but the Linux geek making the decisions and giving the advice. May you know if, if if he or she is peeved with a certain company, yeah. we'll recommend or just, something else. Or just look at the one I've got. Isn't it good? Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. This to. works for me on my choice of operating system. Yeah. So yeah. 
And with such raging debate, we come to the halfway point in our podcast still to come. The discovery of the week and our open ballot. Should geeks prefer free internet services over free with a lowercase f internet services? And straight on to our discovery of the week. Uh, I'm going to be starting this time because I've got such amazing things to discuss. Wow. Uh, I've got two because I always have two. I like having two. One of which is this, and Mike might have to help me out with this one, Mike. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. You need some help. Speicher Zugris Fehler. Can you just say? Speicher Zugris Fehler. Well, Fehler is a, a it means, mistake. It means uh, segmentation fault in German. Yeah. yeah. It's all one word. Segmentation mistake. <laughs> yeah. That's Eisenbahn Knuffelpunkt Tastisch. Have you been reading <laughs> the new German dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's an awesome word. Uh, but the real one. Mike's, Mike's terrified. Actually, I've discovered the open font library. Wow, is that like open clip art? It's sadly just like open clip art. <laughs> oh, dear. Because I don't like open clip art. And so the idea is great. Okay, open fonts. It's all share the fonts we can have and use for free. That's great. But they've done that using the awful code base from open clip art, which oh. means it's very, very hard to find things. You know, if you do open clip art, you search for, I don't know, pink pony in the clip art, and uh, it finds people called pink or pony. And not, not actually any clip art of pink ponies, just people called pink or pony. The same problem is an open, cl- open font library. And the same, the same problems in general, like, you know, you can't see quick previews of stuff without clicking lots of buttons, which is silly. Um, so the idea is awesome. I love having open fonts. There are enough of them. There are so few, in fact, that we need to get them together and start sharing them. I love the idea. Well done, guys. Get your fonts from there. Awesome. Open font library. But I would question the use of the dreadful open clip art code base. Uh, have a think about that well, again. We, we need to just get access to these servers, you know, speak to the people, because all it would change is, is all, it would, all it would require is a certain change to a few SQL queries just to make the searching much better on these sites. Because, like Paul, I really like open clip art. There's, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of rubbish stuff. There's a lot of good stuff, over 13,000 images. Mm. But... They're just so badly organized. Well, they're, they're not categorized. They're yeah. not tagged. They're not nothing. When you it's, download it's them, they're categorized by the person who created them. Yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> so the, the first folder you get is called Anonymous, and there's about 4,000 <laughs> images in that one as well. So, uh, Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily work quite as well as it should do. But the idea is awesome. And right now, because there aren't that many fonts, it's quite easy to get your way around. <laughs> so go there now before they add lots of fonts, and it's impossible to find your way around. What kind of license are the fonts released under? Uh, well, it, anything you can use freely. Right. Uh, so that includes things like public domain, but also liberation fonts and similar Creative Commons stuff. Right. Uh, it's very open. Moving on, who should we pick on next? I think Graham. Right. Well, mine is um, an application called uh, Gnome Inform 7. Now, a sequel to Gnome Inform 6. Yeah, but it, yes, but it's significantly different to 6. All oh, right. Now, what it is, is it's a text adventure creator. Do you remember text adventures when you were little? I, I do. I remember my mummy reading them out to me. Yeah, yeah. It was one of my, your adventure. One of my, <laughs> one of my first <laughs> kinds of game was a, a text adventure on my Electron. It was called The Sphinx by Acorn Soft, and it was a bit of a rip-off of Zork. And I've always loved them. Anyway, Gnome Inform 7 lets you create your own, but the cool thing about it is that um, it uses natural language. So you don't have to be a programmer. You just have to be relatively good at English and constructing short sentences. So you, could t- you, you type in, for example, the office is a room, and... And that becomes a logical component in your game. You can then say the server room is to the north and the emergency exit is to the south. And, and, and you, you click in run in uh, Gnome Inform 7 and you can play your game. You can save that file and you can c- give it to other people who, uh, who use the same interpreter. That, that's really good, but how natural is it? Can you put like the words dude in there and, you know, and stuff? There, there is a dude in the server room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, like, you, you could say there is a dude in the server room. You could say, uh, a coffee cup is here, and you can say, after taking the cup, the cup, say, uh, you sure could do with a fresh brew. And all of this is passed by by the interpreter and, and placed into the, the code for the game. So and it has to be, a coffee cup is here. You can't say, there is a coffee cup here. I don't know. Um, possibly not. There, there are certain rules that you have to follow to kind of re- remove any ambiguity in what you say. Um, but you soon get into the swing of it. It's a bit like playing the adventure game in reverse you get used to a certain way of constructing sentences and constructing rooms but 
it, it's just as good fun as playing the games if, have, if you're interested in them. Have you have you written an adventure game then that our listeners can download and play? Uh, unfortunately, not. No, I've it's, written. It sounds a, like a nice project to do one, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Which is how I discovered for, for yeah. a rainy day or a long train journey. Exactly. That, that it would like be perfect. An awesome project. Run game. And the GNOME Inform Seven keeps on top of all the objects you create. It automatically maps the locations, gives you a graphical overview of where the locations are in relationship to one another, and. Uh, you can you can give your the, the file that you create at the end of it to anyone who with a, an inform interpreter. So that means even people with iPhones can play. So even I, those I, lucky I, people. Out of curiosity, then you said it's significantly different to number six. So what? How did number six? It's go? the natural the natural language part. Oh. Um, before that, it was it was more like programming where you you oh. actually had to script using for if and kind of logic. Ooh. So uh, it's this is the first release with uh, natural language. Impressive. Time for a cave mapping text adventure project. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds great. There is a bat in the cave. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what have you found? Well, I, I want to take things a bit more seriously here now, you know. They, these are all, all good, fun projects. But I discovered um, last week Pink Pony. <gasps> what, on uh, open font? <laughs> no, not on open font. Any, any other guesses where I found Pink Pony? Is that a Deftones album? <laughs> I wouldn't know that. Pink Pony is Tron with ponies. Uh, and that's it from Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Pink, if ev- ev- the game Tron. The game Tron, right. not the film Tron. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I initially thought. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> oh, man. Whereas the Game Tron with Big Ponies. It's, 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 what, what is the Game Tron, Mike? Outline for our new orders. The Game Tron is, um, is, is typically been a top down view um, where you control a dot that leaves a line behind it on a screen. The, uh, the dot is always moving. You can't see Mike moving his fingers while he's talking. No, you can't, but it, it, help, it helps <laughs> <laughs> to, to visualize. Um, so basically, you create these paths on a play field, and you've got to avoid crashing into the other person's path. So as the game continues, the screen gets more and more filled with all these lines, and you've got to avoid them. Um, so Pink Pony takes this to a whole new level. Um, in just 3D for starters. Wow, is Three- it based on GLTron or something like that? Uh, actually, it probably is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you control these um, pink ponies, naturally, uh, running around on these islands, um, and they leave uh, kind of glowing lines behind them and um, colourful hearts as well. And uh, I did challenge Paul to a game of it, of course, and uh, and, and thoroughly and- whooped his ass. What? But, uh, <laughs> all right, we, we, we will play this live on the next podcast. And, um, <laughs> Uh, but yes, I, it's, it's Tron, but with so much, with you know, pink. sweet, sickly cuteness that uh, it's going on the next cover disc. <laughs> with so much sweet, sickly, cute particle things that it can't run on, in, on Mike's computer. Actually, it didn't. Yeah, why, why? There was something wrong with my Intel it, graphics it, it card. Wanted it wanted to do hard work over the particles, I, uh, particles, I think, so it couldn't handle it. So, and if I remember correctly, I, I completely creamed you, even after trying to suicide myself by learning how to swim. Oh, yeah. You, apparently ponies can't swim. Ah, you, you were claiming you were lost on some random island. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Andrew. Andrew. Paul. <laughs> Take it away. I bought um, an MP3 player the other week um, it was under the mistaken apprehension that it could play OGS. Um, so I had to convert a big bunch of OGS into MP3s. And I started doing that with um, with um, OG Dev. And then that made WAVs. And then I started trying to turn the WAVs into MP3s using LAME. And it got really complicated for my small mind. So uh, Graham suggested I use something called the Pearl Audio Converter, which is, um, they've abbreviated to Packpull. I don't know where they get the extra P in there. Uh, but um, but it's, it's really cool because, you know, you, you can just set it, set it going and it works through a whole directory and, and it works within the directories within that directory. So you can just set Nested it away. Nested subdirectories. Nested subdirectories. It's wicked. And you can just watch the... Uh, the output in the terminal and it's um it's hypnotic it's like staring into the flames just watching files being converted into other kinds of files but the key point is that you have to specify that to turn the ogs into mp3s if you leave it at the default setting it will turn your ogs into other slightly smaller ogs <laughs> and then you come back at the end of the day and go <laughs> and feel like a right idiot so don't do that nobody business. wants to feel like a right no, idiot no absolutely <laughs> it's not it's a bad feeling can't you just press F2 and change .org to .mp3? Does that work? No, it was. It, I think didn't didn't they have the MP3 file extension and yet they were ogs, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> it, it, it was something really silly. Yeah. But it, it took my mind off the cricket for a while. 
open ballot. Which this fortnight is actually a closed ballot because of uh, technical issues, meaning that we couldn't accept contributions from readers of tuxradar.com. Well, they were whinging. We posted open ballot questions saying, hey, take part in our podcast. And they were saying, what do you need stupid open ballots for? It's just random stuff. Leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> True. And then, and then we asked for more open ballot suggestions, and I don't think we got any. So Yeah, so forget you. We'll just do it ourselves now. So closed ballot. It is where okay. on. Closed ballots. So closed source ballots. They're the, they're the way for it forward. Um... <laughs> we want we want to know what the, the people in this room think. <laughs> <laughs> think about um, think about free internet services and how they compare with free with a big F internet services. For example, Identica versus Twitter. Twitter is of course the uh, extremely popular time wasting device. And Identica is, is the same, but free. The, and less popular. And much less popular. And so less useful. Microblogging clients, I think they're called. Services. Microblogging, is it 140 characters? Yeah, it is, yeah. Let the world know what you had for breakfast. Yeah. yeah. Again and again and again. Um, Mike, when you're telling people what you had for breakfast, how important is it that the code is free? Um, this is, I, you know, I, I have um, a very kind of fascinating morning regime and I always want the world to know about it. It is fascinating. Go on, Mike, tell them what you do. What do you normally have for breakfast? Um, At 10.29, you <laughs> leave the office. <laughs> <laughs> and where do you go, Mike? And, and I go to um, um, a health spa and... Um, <laughs> that sounds familiar. Um, but being going back to being remotely on topic... Um, I think Identica's just got a stupid name. Because you have to tell people, oh, follow me on Identica, identi- identi.ca. It's a bit like Slashdot, you know, only geeks will get it, so... And that was you coming back on topic, was it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> some, some slightly on topic. So. Um, I, don't, I don't use either of them. I may end up using some micro-blogging service someday, but I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Twitbook. Do you use Gmail? Yep. Does that annoy you that it's not free? Nope. Right. It's great. Well, yeah. I mean, as far as I, I agree with you, I think um, in my there's a there's a copy of me somewhere in a parallel universe that's doing all the right things and <laughs> not using any of these applications. But this version of me finds them far too convenient. So yeah, it is the convenience. I would just yeah. like to clarify one thing though: the Identica is not only open source code. It's you know it's AGPL uh, for a start, but it's also Creative Commons licensed status updates. So everything on there is open for everyone else to use. So you can create feeds from it. You can you, you fill that in and do anything you want, parse it, fiddle around with it, XMLize it, do what you like. You, all your friend data is open as well, so you can pull it off there and move it somewhere else or do other things with it. So, it's all open to fiddling, which is quite cool. So if I write some beautiful haiku poetry on Identica, anybody yeah. else can take it and use it for what they want. By default, oh. by default, it's Creative Commons. You can disable that option if you don't want it. A big copyright the, message. The, the default is it's open, please use it. Get it off, take what you like, do what you want with it. That is brilliant. It is brilliant. That, I think that's the main thing for I me. Mean, I, I would much rather use Identica. But it, it just hasn't got the critical mass of people using it to make it useful for me as a consumer. Have you registered slash Degfil on Identica? I don't think I have, actually. <laughs> <laughs> do it I'll, now. I'll do it now. <laughs> I'm going to do it, yeah. <laughs> and that's the problem, isn't it? The, uh, if you want to get, especially when it comes to microblogging sites, you know, their use is in the number of people using them. It's not really the interface or the software behind it. Yeah, it's harder to be counterculture or yeah. So, what license is the uh, is the content in Gmail under? Well, it's yours, isn't it? It's 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 mine. Google yours. Google can't take it and I don't think so. Make it's private no, correspondence. They, well, they, 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 they've said that they had said previously when it launched, we reserve the right not to delete it. Uh huh. On the grounds that they don't, they don't want to provide guarantees for doing things, but I think now there's like a nine month thing they agree with the EU. Approximately, they agree to delete it within a certain time frame. Right. But yeah, but generally, it's yours. It's your stuff. Unless you are Twitter, of course. You had the uh, Google Docs nicked. Stolen. Oh yeah, of course. Stolen a few weeks ago, uh, which was terrifying, and and released on was it TechCrunch? I don't know. Yeah, it rings well. Well, it wasn't. It was, someone guessed the password basically because um, it was something. You know, password what, one. <laughs> what didn't your, they have a bit of social your engineering? It? Color. Well, well, yeah, yeah, that was that was name. Yeah. It was the secretary or the PA or something. Yeah, exactly. The yeah, they, they got in and then they took the documents away and released them to TechCrunch very kindly. Um, so, but it is yours normally. It's private to you. <laughs> um, but I think it's important because a lot of um, well-known geeks don't use Identica. They only use Twitter. And um, I spoke to Evan Pradromu from Identica. He's the top guy at Identica, and asked him what he thought about these geeks. 
And I use the example of Miguel de Ocasio, the uh, GNOME founder, the mono hacker, Zimian Chap and Novell, top bot. And because Miguel said, how do I find people on this thing? Why does this thing not support my font settings? Then all in caps, this is horrible. And um, Evan was really blunt. <laughs> he was right to the point. I got this recorded. And I'm going to uh, read out what he said. And, uh, but I'll do it because I, I, we, need, we need Graham here to provide, <laughs> provide censoring for what he said. <laughs> Just in case there are some sensitive ears <clears throat> listening or children or something. So I'm going to uh, read out what he said. And Graham will provide some sort of censoring if possible. Also because swearing isn't big or clever. You're right. So Evan's response about Miguel was, Right, so what really happened here, there was that Miguel de Acasa is totally useless, someone who was totally not a big supporter of us ever. He was a total beep. I mean, pardon my French, but he was a total beep. I mean, he came onto the site. This guy, the guy who started Gnome, Gnome was a piece of beep <laughs> for like many years. And he comes onto our site and he can't figure out how to use the buttons. And he says all that nasty stuff. I've got nothing for him. He's a beep. He was a total beep about it. <laughs> and of course, he went on to say, off recording, beep, 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 beep. Daffodil. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he was very blunt about it, but you know, it raises a lot of important questions. Why does one of our free software leaders, if you, even if you don't agree at Microsoft stuff, he still does strong free software code with GNOME, why does this guy, uh, in general, just not care about using Identica? He doesn't go back to it. He hasn't gone back to it. Neither is like Nat Friedman or a lot of the other guys. Um, they just don't seem to care. Should we care? Yeah, I think they should. I think they should set an example. I don't think there's anything wrong in They should, but you shouldn't. That, well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not in the same influential position that they're in. But, but, but we are setting an example, aren't we? Because we have, don't we? Have yeah, a, we, we have identity. We use both. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, had a, we had an Entica for ages and no Twitter. Ages. And um, I was insisting on not using Twitter. But yeah, then I, yeah. I had about 100 followers on Entica and then tried Twitter and had 100 in about 24 hours. <laughs> it was it yeah. was quite silly, and now we've got uh, what five times the number of Twitter followers than Identica followers. What, what's our Twitter URL or whatever it is? Uh, yes, you should follow us on Twitter and Identica <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> at uh, at Tux Radar. Um, it's not not hard to find. Yeah, I mean, what what? How hard could it be for them to duplicate their tweets on Identica and? Uh, on well, actually, Earth it's Twitter. very easy because with Identica, you can post Identica and tell it to forward on to Twitter. So it'll say on, it, on Twitter, posted from Identica. Yeah. So there's nothing which you helps lose. spread the branding at the same time, yeah. helps get more people over to Identica. Uh, I don't do that because I'm lazy. I just use the web interface <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and paste them both into the same box. I, I'm, I'm slightly confused by Miguel de Acasa's problem with the buttons on the site because <laughs> isn't it just all you know? When I've used it before on behalf of Tux Radio, you just put some stuff in a box and click go. Yes, but that's because you're using I think 0.7. Oh. Um, they originally released, I think, 0.4, and they made a big push saying, you know, geeks of the world, tell all your friends to switch Identica. And a lot of them did. The word got passed around very, very quickly to try Identica, and it was 0.4. Uh, it wasn't ready, basically, right. what it comes down to. And uh, there were lots of problems. And at the time, I think there was a focusing issue with the send button. You couldn't, like, press tab, enter to send. Oh, so you had to actually pick up the mouse, pick the mouse and, and click it. Right. I think approximately that's what the problem was. I have to ask Miguel otherwise. Um, but yeah, there were initial flaws they have since fixed, and you know, it's now functionality way ahead of Twitter. It does things Twitter can't do. Right. Which is great. Which you think geeks would love then. You you know, we all want features think, exactly, and toys exactly, to play with. So. Exactly. It's awesome stuff. Um, but it, it takes time for people to try it again. They may have been burnt so badly by a first attempt and they don't want to come back to it. Mm. Like Mike with KDE1. Oh, I really liked KDE1, you see. Um, what, I just... what made you switch? Um, I, I moved to ISWM and then Window Maker and I just loved him. I mean, I just forgot about the rest of the world. So you discovered reverse gear, basically, and <laughs> got stuck in it. There wasn't KD2 up north when I was growing up. <laughs> That's because we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford the electrons to run it. But no was only in black and white, so well, what choice did we have? <laughs> That's true, yeah. We had a pizza call for lunch. And with those golden memories, we come to the end of our podcast... Don't forget, all the notes for this podcast are on the website. <sighs> oh, <laughs> wait, what, what's going on? Sorry, where are we? Oh, Mike, come on, this is really rude. Sorry, You're no, worse I, than Linus Torvalds. I thought I, I, was, I, was, I was getting a Big Mac and then I suddenly wake up and find myself here. What's happened? Where are we? And with that, we come to the end of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was it. I was supposed to do a one more thing. Yes. Um, ah, right. Yeah, I remember now. Um, I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> which some of you may know, but a bit of Linux trivia here. So shout out whoever gets it first. 
What did Linus Torvalds originally call his colonel? Pink Pony. Uh, close, but completely wrong. <laughs> if I know the answer, should I not say? No, say it. Say it. Freaks. It is indeed Freaks. F-R-E-A-X. When Linus Torvalds first uploaded, like version 0.0.0.0.1, to his FTP server in Finland at Helsinki University, the, um, the server admin said, no, that's a stupid name, it looks stupid, don't do it. Call it something like Linux. And Linus didn't want to call it Linux because he thought that would be, you know, too egotistical and self-referential. But he was convinced, so... But he's it's, grown into it now. He's grown into it. He's grown to love it, yeah. Um, he's, he's still humble. <laughs> yeah. So, which is a good job, really, because otherwise we'd be working on Freaks Format uh, magazine. Maybe, maybe it's Freax. Freax. I've never heard him pronounce it, actually. No. Perhaps it's something we should ask. Hello, my name is Linus, and I pronounce <laughs> Linus. it Freax. <laughs> Freax. That's more Welsh than Finnish, isn't it, really? Uh, yeah, That's Alan sounds... Cox. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Our Alan Cox impersonation of the month. Can I ask you a question, then? Trivia question. Absolutely. Uh, what's RMS's middle name? Matthew. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we both got one right. Infinite geekness. <laughs> Touché. So tune in in two weeks' time for more comedy trivia and waste of time and all the notes are on the site subscribe to Linux format at tinyurl.com slash podcast alexf we'll see you later bye 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 bye